Psalm 137. Beginning at verse 1, Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, we, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away captive required of us a song, and those who plundered us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy shall he be who repays you as you have served us. Happy shall be he who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. This is a cheerful psalm. This is what is called an imprecatory psalm. It's, it's a psalm where he's actually calling on God to bring judgment or to punish those who have, have harmed the nation of Israel. It's an imprecatory psalm as well as a historical psalm because this psalm uh, speaks concerning uh, the Babylonian captivity that the nation of Israel suffered for some 70 years. It's interesting when you study your, your Old Testament that, that First and Second Kings as well as First and Second Chronicles in the Old Testament uh, actually record the history of Israel up to the point where the Jews are taken captive. But uh, it doesn't give us a lot of detail after that. You'll see later books like Ezra and Nehemiah and the book of Esther that will pick up the strain of Jewish history after their 70-year captivity. You'll also notice that in the book of Daniel, Daniel who had been taken captive in one of the incursions of, uh, of Babylon against uh, Israel, you'll notice that in the book of Daniel, Daniel speaks and writes during that period of time that the nation of Israel was in captivity. Uh, but he doesn't give any information concerning the general conditions of the Jews during that, that time of captivity. Uh, and so you really don't have much information relating to the condition of Israel or the people of Israel when they were in this captivity in the uh, nation of Babylon. Psalm 137 actually gives us a glimpse or an insight into the heart of some of those who had been taken captive, and that's what we'll be looking at as we look at Psalm 137. Now, we need to, uh, to set this up for just a moment. We need to realize, even as I mentioned a moment ago, that the, uh, the nation of Israel was taken into captivity uh, by the, the Babylonians. Actually, the king of Babylon, whose name was Nebuchadnezzar, actually orchestrated three incursions against Israel uh, as he came against them on three different uh, uh, times till he finally uh, removed the inhabitants of Israel and took them into, into Babylon. Uh, and the reason that that happened is because they had failed to remain. The nation had failed to remain faithful to God. Uh, the nation of Israel actually committed a series of sins, but uh, two of the things that stand out in Scripture is one is they failed to keep what are called the Sabbath rests of the land. They didn't rest the land. According to Levitical law, they were supposed to plow and work the land for six years. The seventh year they were to rest, but they hadn't rested the land and, uh, in, for 490 years. And so because of that, God gave to them a judgment that would force them to allow the land to rest, and that was a 70-year period that they went into captivity. That's one of the reasons reasons that they were brought into captivity. And the second reason is because they had become idolatrous. They had refused to do the things that God had commanded. You see, in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Old Testament, uh, God was laying down His blessings and His cursings on the nation of Israel. And He said, if you do these things, I will bless you. But if you fail to do these things, then I will bring curses upon you. And in Deuteronomy, if you take notes, it's found in chapter 27. In Deuteronomy 27, verse 15, the Lord said, It shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all His commandments and His statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And at that point, a list of curses are, 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 are given, and, and then you come to verse 36 of chapter 27, and this is one of the curses. The Lord will bring you and the king whom you, whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. 
In other words, if you don't obey my word, ultimately you will be taken captive and you will become idolatrous. In 2 Chronicles, in chapter 7, verses 19 and 20, God said, If you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, and then I will uproot them from my land which I have given them. This house which I have sanctified for my name I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And so they had failed to keep the law of God. They had gotten into idolatry. They had failed to keep his law as it related to resting the land and all, and they were rebellious. As, as, a, uh, as a result of the rebellion, God brought judgment against them, and Babylon was dispatched, and Babylon uh, took them captive. And in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 44, verses 2 and 3, Thus says the, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, You have seen all the calamity that I have brought on Jerusalem and on all the cities of Judah. Behold, this day they are a desolation. No one dwells in them because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger, in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they did not know, they nor you nor your fathers. And so the Lord allowed them to go in through punishing them, dealing with them into uh, captivity, into Babylon, and they were there for 70 years. This psalm, Psalm 137, the psalm that we're looking at right now was actually uh, written uh, while they're in captivity. And so this gives us an insight into the heart of at least one of the individuals who is there in Babylon. And notice what he writes in verse 1. He writes, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. And so he gives to us uh, the fact that he's there in, uh, in, in Babylon by the river Euphrates, and he's weeping over the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. This one once beautiful and, and proud city was in ruins. As we were there recently, just, you know, a week and a half ago, as we're there in the city of Jerusalem, our guide is pointing out the fact that many of the Jews who would, who would come into the city of Jerusalem came from small villages, some villages that only have 50, 15 to 20, uh, you know, families living in the village. And so when you look at a map of Israel and you see Jerusalem almost like in the center and you go up to the north into what we call the Galilee region, um, there were many small villages and, and communities up there, but they weren't, they, you know, they were inhabited by maybe 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 families. So imagine for just a moment if you were from a rural village like that, but you would come down for the yearly pilgrimages to observe the feasts, the three mandatory feasts. Imagine what your heart must have felt like as you came into this magnificent city that was regarded even by pagans as the most beautiful city in the world. And imagine what your heart would have felt like as you went into the region that had the temple of God. And now you've been picked up, you, your family, and everything, and you've been taken hundreds of miles away into a pagan land called Babylon. And there he is by the river Euphrates, and he's thinking, as I was there by the river, my heart would, was broken and I would weep as I remembered the city of Zion. Zion is, is another name for Jerusalem. And so as he's there, he's, his heart is broken, and he's thinking concerning what has happened to that beautiful city. Uh, Jeremiah uh, writes in what is called the Book of, of Lamentations in chapter 1, verse 10, and he says, The enemy laid hands on all her treasures. She saw pagan nations enter her sanctuary, those you had forbidden to enter your assembly. And the nation, uh, the, the city was languishing. It was in pain. There was never sorrow like her sorrow. And you read the book of Lamentations, and, and you see a picture of Jerusalem weeping concerning her sin. Well, that's what he's talking about. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Verse 2, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there, those who carried us away captive required of us a song. And those who plundered us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Now, we need to know that Jewish music very often was very festive. It was, it was a, a joyful kind of sound. And so the oppressors are, are now taunting them. When they're saying to them, uh, play some of the music that you used to sing in, uh, back at home, when it says, those who carried us away captive required of us a song, those who plundered us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion, it was really a taunt. 
You need to remember that during this day, if, if I represented a, a certain nation, we'll say Babylon, and, and you were Jewish, and, and I came against you with my army, and I defeated you, what I was actually believing is my God has defeated your God. And so this is a taunt. They're actually mocking the Jews. They're saying, listen, you've got these songs of deliverance. You've got these songs that speak about, about your conquest. You have songs that relate to, to your history. Sing us one of your songs, and, and we want to hear you joyfully sing it. And what they were do is, doing was taunting them. The question that they were really saying, it was really a question is, where is your God? Where's your God now, now that you're in captivity? And they're saying, our God is greater than yours. He says in verse 4, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How can we sing of God's deliverance in the past while we are present, pre presently living in Babylon in captivity? See, for the Jews, the only place to sing songs of Zion was actually in Zion. It's interesting when you consider this, you know, the Jews knew that they would sing their songs of praise to the Lord while they're there in the city of Jerusalem, especially as they're worshiping Him. It's interesting how they said, we, we won't sing a song. We're not going to sing one of those songs. How can you require of us a song in that way in verse 4? How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? But you want to know a Christian application to this is that's exactly what we do. That's what we as believers do, isn't it? I and mean, we're pilgrims and we're sojourners. We, you know, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. Whereas the Jew would say, look it, I'm not going to sing a song of praise and worship to God when I'm in Babylon. It's interesting, the New Testament application is that's exactly what we do because we're just passing through here. And yes, we realize that we live in an area that, that in a world that is, uh, you know, hasn't come completely under the control of the Lord. Yet as believers, we know that ultimately it will, and therefore we can sing praises to the Lord. But the, the, the writers here say, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Then he goes on in verse 5 to say, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. It's interesting what he's saying here. He, he's basically saying, may my speech and my skills remain at the disposal of the Lord. When he speaks concerning his right hand and when he speaks concerning his tongue, we need to realize, of course, when he says in verse 5, let my right hand forget her skill, that's speaking of his works. When he says in verse 6, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth, he's speaking of his words. So he's basically saying, uh, I want to make sure that I, in word and in action, remain at disposal of the Lord. Though the temple is in ruins, I'm not going to forget the reality of it because the temple isn't God. Uh, my faith is not in the temple. My faith is in God. And so I want to serve uh, the Lord is the point he's making, and I'm going to cling to his promises no matter what. So in verse 7, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, meaning destroy it to its very foundation. He, he's saying basically there, uh, the sons of Edom or the descendants of Esau, uh, they, uh, that would be in what we would call today modern Jordan. Uh, he's saying, I want you to remember, Lord, remember them, uh, because they encouraged the Babylonians to destroy the nation. And he's basically saying, and may they be judged for doing so. In verse 8, O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy shall he be who repays you as you have served us. This verse 9 is a very terrible verse, to be honest with you. Happy shall he be who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Now, that's a very strong word. Uh, he's basically saying, may, may you one day receive what you have done to others. Interestingly enough, this actually literally occurred in uh, the nation of Babylon when the Medes and the Persians uh, overwhelmed and, and uh, took Babylon. According to the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 13, verses 15 and 16, God said, everyone who is found will be thrust through and everyone who is captured will fall by the sword. Their children also will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered. Their wives will be ravished. And so this is a very terrible imprecation. He's basically saying, may they receive for what they have done. They have dashed our children, and may that occur to them. Now, I don't want to go into a, a long uh, discussion about that other than simply saying that's a, a very terrible, terrible wish to have 
uh, about anybody. You know, and yet he's, he's speaking his heart, and he's saying, Lord, this what they've done to us. May they receive themselves. Psalm 138. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. Your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. Psalm 138. So when we look at the first three verses, and I want you to see this, uh, the first three verses, um, this is something, this is one of those, those portions of Scripture that if a person is, uh, is not committed to the Lord, if, if they're lukewarm in their faith, if they're, if they're carnal in their lifestyle, they're not going to relate well to this at all. You know, because lukewarm uh, Christians, people who, who have a, a very tepid uh, relationship with the Lord, uh, or a carnal person, somebody who's too busy trying to find out how many things he can do and still go to heaven, um, don't really have uh, much of a concern for this kind of thing. Uh, when I note the first verse, I will praise you with my whole heart, I mean, that's what God requires of all of us, isn't it? I mean, that's not just for pastors and teachers. I mean, that's for every believer, every, every, every Christian, every person of faith in the Lord is, is called to have this as a sentiment. You've got to have, in other words, a center in your life. You've got to have a focal point. You have to have a chief passion, a major desire. You have to be like the Apostle Paul who says, this one thing I do. That has to be what your life is. If you're going to understand this Scripture, if you're going to understand what he's talking about, you have to make a decision. Perhaps you need to do that even tonight, but you have to make a decision. God, I want to understand what it means to praise you with my whole heart because God nowhere, old or new, ever calls anybody to a half-hearted commitment to him. Nowhere do you ever see Jesus Christ say, be my part-time follower. He never says anywhere, listen, I would like you to follow me at least two out of seven days in the week. Nowhere in the Bible do you see him ever calling people that, to that kind of relationship, and yet I would have to say the overwhelming majority of people that I know who claim to have faith in Christ are once a week or twice a month believers, and, and they're not wholeheartedly committed to the Lord. They don't have a, a desire in their heart for God and say, God, I hunger for you, I thirst for you, I desire you, early will I seek you. That's not their lifestyle. Their lifestyle is that, is that I will see the Lord, I'll go to church once in a while. I don't want to be too radical about this. I don't want to be too fanatic about this. You know, I'll go to church on Easter, and I'll, and I'll go to church on, uh, on Christmas for sure. And if there's a wedding that's in a church, I'll go, and, 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 and I'll be involved in some of the things once in a while. That's the average person that I, en that I encounter uh, today. And, and there are many people that I encounter who claim to be Christians. And when you look at surveys, that, that say anywhere from 83% to, to over 90% of, uh, of Americans in the United States claim not just to have religious faith, but claim to be Christians in their orientation, and yet uh, you don't see the world change. You don't see the nation changing. There ought to be an incredible change taking place that that many people have a relationship with God, you would think. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, is a lack of commitment to Christ. Uh, the problem is, is affection for things that don't matter. The problem is, is people saying, you know what, I'm going to get as much as I can while I can when I'm young, and, and, and when I get older and, and, I'm, and I'm settled in everything, uh, and then I'll, I'll become more serious in my faith with God, and, uh, and that's what happens. You know, we have people who are very committed but not to the Lord. 
Uh, I find it interesting that, that when the summer hits us, very often we have, you know, and I know this because my kids played sports, you know, they played soccer and, and, and they played uh, Little League Baseball and all. And, and we have parents, in, even in this church, who will say, listen, you know, it's difficult for my kids to get up on, on Thursday or on Monday if I go to an evening service. You know, and I just, it's just tough for them to get up. And yet we have baseball games. We have baseball games on Tuesday nights. And the games sometimes will start at 7 o'clock. And the kid will be playing baseball until 9. And then after the game, they go home. They stay up till 10. And they go to bed. And they get up the next day and go to school. But the parents are saying, no, I don't want them to be grumpy. And yet it's okay for them to take a weekend because they're in a tournament and they're playing in Phoenix and we have to leave Friday night. But you know what? On Sunday, even though they have a tournament game that day and we'll be driving home later in the afternoon, well, we'll, we'll pray with them or, or maybe we'll, we'll, we'll open up the Scripture and, and read a, a verse to them before they go play soccer. And then when the kids get to be 16, 17, and 18, especially when they hit 18, and they say to mom and dad, I really don't want to go to church, mom and dad will say, but I raised you a Christian. You know, what you did is you raised them to be a good soccer player. You raised them to maybe get a scholarship to go to college playing soccer. Or you, you raised them to keep them out of trouble by putting them in sports so they could play, you know, Little League Baseball or whatever it may be. And your Christianity was lukewarm. And you taught them carnality. And you taught them you don't have to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. You taught them that if it's convenient and it's not Super Bowl Sunday, we go to church. That's what we taught them. See, so a lukewarm believer does not understand what he's talking about here in Psalm 138. I will praise you with all of my heart. A lukewarm believer doesn't understand that. A carnal one most definitely doesn't relate to this at all. And yet, this is what he's saying. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I'll sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness, for your truth, for you have magnified your word above your name, all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. And so where does this boldness come from? I want you to see this in verse 3. You made me bold with strength in my soul. Where does that come from? Let me give you a few things. Where's boldness come from? There are several components that work together that produces a courageous walk with God. One, you see in verse 2, is, is worship and praise. When you worship and praise the Lord, plus uh, two, verse 2, he speaks of also God's loving kindness. When you have worship and prayer and praise, you have a knowledge of God's love for you. In verse 2, you also have a knowledge of God's Word, which is His truth. And then, and then in verse 3, you have a knowledge that God answers prayer. When you have worship, praise, God's word, God's love, and a knowledge that God answers prayer, you're going to have courageous uh, way of life. You're going to know that God is with you. That's how it works. When you see God working in your life because you spend time worshiping him, when you, when you turn on your radio and instead of listening to some oldie station or some, some hip-hop station or whatever it is that you might like, uh, God forbid, country music, I mean, if you turn on, if you turn on the, 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 the radio and you listen to this stuff all the way to work and all the way home, well, you're filling yourself up with the message of that music. But what happens when you turn on worship and praise? What happens when you're driving home and you turn on the radio and you're listening to ex ex exaltation of Jesus Christ. And you know what happens? I'll tell you what happens. Your mind is centered on things above, not things below. That's what happens. And, and I, I found this to be true in my own life, and I don't think I'm unique in this. I wake up every morning, every morning, this is the truth. I wake up every morning with a song in my mind, every morning. And I bless the Lord because these are Christian songs. I wake up with a Christian song, a song of praise in my heart to the Lord, and I thank God for that. I thank God for that because I sang the old songs for too long. I sang them for too long. And, and now I'm waking up with the worship and praise in my heart, and that's how it starts, and, 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 and a time in God's Word, and, and a time in, in prayer. And, and, you know, you wake up in the morning and you pray, oh, God, help me. 
Help me get out. Help me put my left foot in front of the right one. Oh, God. And we're all religious first thing in the morning. But notice he says in verse 3, in the day when I cried out, you answered me. I cried out to you when I was having a, a, a bad time, and you answered me. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are with me. And that gives me courage in my heart to speak in front of people. It's interesting, he says in verse 1, before the gods I will sing praises to you. In other words, I will not be intimidated by those who don't worship you. I'm not going to be a silent believer. I'm not going to be a chameleon Christian just kind of blending with the scenery and not wanting to say anything that causes anybody else discomfort. I'm going to be open in my faith about Jesus Christ. It reminds me of how that, uh, on one occasion, in the book of Acts in chapters 3 and 4, how, how, how Peter and John had gone to the temple during the hour of prayer, and as they were about to enter into that temple there, uh, there was a man there at the gate called Beautiful who was, who was asking for financial aid. They call it alms, charitable gifts. And, and, and when they were walking in, this man had been there for some time, and, and, and the apostle Peter, as he walks in, looks down, and the Scripture says he, his eyes were fastened on the man, and the man, and he says to the man, now look upon us. And, and the man looking up, the Scripture says, expecting to receive something, well, Peter looks at him and he says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I say unto you, Rise to your feet and walk. And reaching down, he takes him by the hand and he receives strength in his ankle bones. And before you know it, he's walking, he's leaping, and he's praising God. A tremendous miracle has happened. People have gathered around, and the apostle Peter at that point uh, begins to preach the message of the gospel. He's ultimately arrested. Then he's threatened and told, Don't speak in this name any longer, but they're, they're, they're not about to, to follow the commands of men and quench the Spirit of God. They're ultimately released, and then they go back to the other disciples, and, and they begin to pray. And as they're praying together with the other disciples, if you take notes, it's found in Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31. As they're praying, they say, Lord, look on their threats. Grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke the Word of God with boldness. And that's what happens when you say, Lord, I want to be used by you. For so many years, I was willing to be identified with the things that you hate. I ask in the, in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, that I will not shrink from being identified with Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. You see, when you have this inside of you, this, this, this knowledge, I want to be used by God, and you're in His Word, and you're in prayer, and you're worshiping the Lord, and you know God answers your prayer, then you'll, you'll discover that secret place where God reveals Himself. You'll discover that, and it'll become the place that you live. It'll become the place of your greatest joy and your greatest strength, because that's all that matters, ultimately. And... Um, you know, when we were in Israel, and then I went to Spain. We went to Spain for, um, for four days after Israel. We were in Barcelona. Barcelona. I'll say Barcelona to Marie just to get her mad. She hates it when I lisp like that. But that's how they pronounce it. You know that, Barcelona. Que pasó? You know, but anyway, you know, it's, and so... <laughs> I like doing that, so I'll do that to Maria. I'll say, oh, here we are in, in sunny Barcelona, and she just does not <laughs> like it at all, where the sun never sets. <laughs> but we're there, and that's where the Europeans come, the, the variety of people from various countries, especially from Great Britain. They come there, Americans come there to party. They'll party nonstop. Because when in Spain, you know this, they, they don't even, they, you know, they don't go to bed as, as a people until 2 or 3 o'clock every morning. I mean, they don't eat breakfast. I mean, breakfast for them starts at 10. And when you eat breakfast, it's not eggs. They say, you, you want an American breakfast. You know, for them, it's a sandwich. You know, and then you have a 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock siesta, or siesta. And <laughs> it's just really interesting. But as you're there, all of these people... I was just overwhelmed for four days. You, uh, they're 
crowds and crowds and hundreds of people crowding all these streets in, in Barcelona. And it's hitting me. In, in Spain, there are 44, 44 million, 44 to 45 million Spaniards. Out of the 44 to 45 million Spaniards, less than 1% are saved. Less than 1%. They're traditionally Catholic still. They have their weddings and their baptisms because that's Spanish culture. But they don't, they don't go to church. I mean, on Sunday, they're out, they're out just wandering around. If they're out at all, they're just wandering around going, you know, eating. and There's just, there's just no religious life whatsoever. And, and I was telling one of the guys, I was saying, you know, what's striking me and this, in this time of rest is you, you really can't rest because this nation is going to hell, the whole nation is going to hell. And when you're in Israel, and, and uh, it's interesting, if you're a Jewish atheist, you can have Jewish citizenship. If you're an American atheist, but you have Jewish heritage, you can apply for citizenship in Israel and receive it because you're Jewish. But if you're a Christian, they will not give you citizenship because they do not consider you to be Jewish. You can be a Buddhist, you can be an atheist, but you cannot be a Christian and be a Jew simultaneously in their mind. And so what you have is, is a nation of several million rejecting Jesus Christ, a very large fellowship in Israel. We met a, a brother who's, who goes to the largest church in Tel Aviv, and that church consists of 300 people. That's one of the largest churches in Israel, 300 people. And the nation of several millions all of them perishing without God. Where are you going to get the strength? Where are you going to get the ability to stand up and say, this is what truth is, if you're not in prayer, if you're not in the Word of God, and if you don't worship? Where are you going to get the strength to do that? See, a carnal and lukewarm person, what I'm saying right now makes no sense to them, and they could care less. But a person who loves the Lord, their heart is saying, that's what I want to do. I want to worship you. I want to love your word. I want to be bold and courageous in my witness. And I know you answer prayer. So this is my heart. See, that's what the psalmist is saying. I will praise you with my whole heart. Verse 4, all the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. And so when he says in verses 4 through 6, all the kings of the earth shall praise you, his prayer is simply that all kings of the earth will give God the honor and the glory that is due his name. Now, ultimately, that prayer is answered, but that is answered when Jesus rules and when Jesus finally reigns. Revelation 21, verses 23 through 24 says, The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Verse 7, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. Your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. In other words, simply put, I know you love me, and I know you will deliver me, and all I need to do is trust you because your mercy endures forever. Psalm 139. This is a psalm of David. It's one of the most beautiful psalms in the Bible. As a matter of fact, it's a psalm that I almost wanted to do by itself. It's so beautiful, but I'm not going to be able to do that. So tonight we'll just look at it and just touch on it a bit. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before, laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. This is a psalm as we go through this that celebrates what are called the attributes of God. Now, of course, when you 
when you get into theology and all, you'll notice that there are, there are really quite a number of, of attributes that are listed in Scripture, but we all in this room know three of those attributes, omniscience and omnipresence and omnipotence. You know, all knowledge, uh, God is everywhere at one time, and God has all power. Now, we know that, but those three qualities of God are actually mentioned here in this psalm, and so it celebrates those three attributes of God, His omniscience, omnipotence, and His omnipresence. And, and what He's doing here as we begin Psalm 139 is He's celebrating. He's celebrating the fact that God, the God of the universe, the God of the universe, and we Americans don't really understand that very well, and we think, well, of course he knows us. Well, you know, the God of the universe, it ought to humble us to realize that, that he actually considers us because he's so awesome and, and we aren't. You know, we, we whisper and he thunders. There's, there's just such a difference between puny humanity and an all-powerful God. And, and that's what he's speaking about. That's what he's celebrating here is the reality of this incredible God who actually knows him. Uh, notice how he says in verses 2 and 3, he says, You know my sitting down, my rising up, and you understand my thought afar off. When he speaks of, of, of God, he uses words like understand and comprehend and, and you are acquainted with me. When he speaks about him understanding my thought, that word understand speaks of to consider something with diligence or to discern when he speaks of, of God uh, comprehending, it means to winnow. It means to sift him. It, it's separating his essence so that God knows who the real person is. When he speaks about God being acquainted with him, it means that God knows him intimately. God completely understands him. You mamas can understand that word because you've got a baby, and the baby's beginning to form sentences. And so, here comes a neighbor or maybe an uncle, an aunt, even grandpa or grandma. And the baby's, you know, a year old, however old, 14, 15 months old. And the baby's making noise. At least that's what, I'll, I'll say, it. I'm the grandpa, I'm looking at my grandson Josiah. And I think he's speaking in tongues and I'm calling for an interpretation. What is he saying? <laughs> But Mama says, he's saying this. And I'm looking at my daughter thinking, you got to get out more often. <laughs> I mean, how can you understand that? <laughs> oh, he's saying he's very happy. How do you know what he's saying? You're making that up. But you want to know something? That Mama knows that baby because he formulates words, then she knows what he's trying to say. There's an intimacy there between mama and baby that outsiders cannot relate to. Or you're a husband, you've been married to the same woman for 25, 30 years, and, and you know when she's talking to you when she's serious or when she's just saying something that you know if you're not careful, you're going to get blown up in about 10 seconds. <laughs> Does this dress make me look fat? What, you want, it, you want, you want a fight? You, 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 you know, you know. I'm sorry, honey, I'm blind temporarily. I, uh, <laughs> you answer that, you're dead. You know that. Well, honey, it flatters you. Yeah, but what's that really mean? It, it means, honey, uh, I want to live another day. I mean, you know. You know, you learn that. You know, you know, I can tell you, I know, I know my wife. You know, I've been with her a long time. And, and the longer you're with that person, you know them. Well, that's what he's saying. He's saying, God, you know me. You're acquainted with me. You know, you, 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 you have sifted my heart. And you know who I truly am. And that's what he's excited about. You have searched me, known me. You know my sitting down, my rising up. You know, uh, you, you, you know when I sit down, you know when I get up. You, you understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path, my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. And there's not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You've hedged me behind and before, laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I can't attain it. Lord, I just bless you because you know all things. This is his omniscience. You know not only what, what I say, 
<laughs> this is an interesting thing, by the way. In verse 4, there's not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You know not only what I have said, but you also know what I would have said if I had said what I wanted to say. You know what I'm talking about? You know everything about me. And uh, to me, that's, that's a wonderful thing. The Bible tells us uh, that, uh, that God is aware of everything about us, and, and just this idea that the Lord is aware of even my words before I even speak them absolutely just, just, just thrills me. When he says, you hedged me behind and before I laid your hand upon me, Lord, you have encompassed me, you're protecting me, you strengthen me. That's just so mind-blowing, I just don't know what I can do. I, I, it is high, I can't attain it. Where, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Uh, this is his omnipresence. If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I, I take the wings of the morning, dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Your presence comprehends all dimensions of existence, God material as well as spiritual. Darkness cannot conceal me because you're not night blind. God can see everything. His eye is on you constantly. The Bible in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 says, there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of, of him to whom we must give an account. His eyes are on you constantly. And, and one of the things the Lord taught me uh, about that that I, I constantly relearn is, is, is when my children were small, they might be doing something, you know, playing or just sitting there enjoying themselves, and, and they didn't know that my eyes were on them. They would be outside sometimes playing, and, and my eye was on them. I was protecting them the best that I could as a human parent. And, and sometimes I would, I would just sit there and look out the, the back window at my children as they were at play, and it would just speak to my heart and would touch me. And I remember protecting them to the best of my ability. I didn't want anybody to harm them, and I would keep my eye on them. Now, there was a time when my David and my, my Corinne, my two oldest children, Corinne being the oldest and David being the second child, uh, were probably maybe uh, eight years old and six years old, and, and they wanted to make some extra money by selling lemonade. You know how kids will set up their lemonade stands, you know, and, and they make the lemonade, and they put, you know, lemonade for a nickel or whatever, and, and they ask, can, can we sell lemonade and make some money? And I said, sure, of course. And, and so they went out into the backyard, and I put them behind on the, on the driveway behind the fence, and they sat there behind the fence for about an hour. And, and, and I finally came out and bought some lemonade from them, you know, and made their day. They didn't realize what I'd done for years. And then one day, David finally walked up and said, Dad, I just got what you did. You had us in the backyard behind a fence. Who's going to see us? And I said, right. And who's going to take you? Nobody. You know, and that's just kind of what we did. I would watch my children. I'm doing the same thing now with my grandson. I do the same thing with Josiah. You know, I will see him, and he doesn't notice me. He's too busy playing, but Papa's eyes on him. And you know what? The Lord has ministered to me. You know, he watches us. His eye is upon us, and he keeps his eyes on you because he simply can't take them off of you. He loves you that much. Now, think about that next time you think nobody loves you. The eyes of the Lord are upon you. And he loves you. And that's what he's talking about. Verse 13, you have formed my inward parts. You have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. This is so heavy. I wish I could just take, I wish I had the time to give to you so much. This is so powerful, and I really can't give you that much tonight. 
But let me give you a little bit. In verse 13, you have formed. That word formed, I looked it up in the Hebrew because the Old Testament's written in Hebrew. I wanted to know what, what do you mean you have formed me? Because there are different words that you can use, Hebrew words that can be translated by the single English word formed. That, that word formed there has actually uh, a connotation of redemption, and he's literally saying you've redeemed. But notice he says you have formed my inward parts. The words inward parts, the word inward there, literally kidneys. Interesting, huh? You have formed my kidneys? I mean, what are you talking about? You know, what he's talking about here is the word kidneys also speaks of literally reins, R-E-I-G-N-S, reins, no, R-E-I-N-S. Anyway, reins. It speaks concerning your emotions. Now, this is where it's powerful if you let it go into your heart. You have redeemed my emotions. What am I saying now? I'm saying that because God purchased me, He also works in my inner parts, my insides. And my emotions that I can be prone to, listening to my lying heart, if my heart condemns me, the Scripture says, God is greater than my heart, and He knows all things. Some people are flighty in their emotions. But he's saying, you formed me from the inside, and you redeemed me from the inside. I can be a different person altogether. Whereas at one time I was prone to anger fits or times of depression or melancholia, Lord, I can now have the joy of thy salvation because you're in control of my life. And so, Lord, take from me that, that garment of sorrow and replace it with with a garment of joy. You have formed my inner parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. That's an interesting word. That word covered speaks of something that is woven together. And there are two different ways to apply this. The way that I choose to apply it here is a picture of procreation where the male sperm and the, and the egg are actually woven together. And that's the picture he's talking about is reproduction. You have covered me in my mother's womb. In other words, that's, you know, that's where I was formed. So I, verse 14, will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My value comes from the Lord, not what, not what some magazine says or, or what the mirror even tells me. My value comes from the Lord. He says in verse 15, my, my frame, that word frame is your bones or your skeleton was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. That speaks of the fact that you're in a mother's womb and you were being formed there. And skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth is another picture of that which is unseen. Again, a baby being formed uh, inside a womb and, and, and uh, being unseen from the outside. Your eyes saw my substance being unformed, being yet unformed. And in, in your book, they are all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Uh, I'm, I'm alive. And the point he's making is I was alive while in the womb. Again... The Bible makes it very clear, at least as, as I read it, that, uh, you know, that, uh, well, I'll put it this way. Um, when somebody's making a choice to terminate their pregnancy through an abortion, an elective procedure, very often they don't refer to the baby as a baby, do they? They will refer to it as what? As a fetus or a glob of tissue. Anything we can do to reduce its humanity. So we refer to it in, 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 in euphemisms because we don't want to speak about it as being a baby because that's, that's too serious. So, so it's the fetus. We terminated a pregnancy is the way it is spoken of in our society today. But it's interesting to note that, that you might be, you know, we'll say three months pregnant. One woman speaks of her fetus because she's terminating but the other woman who's three months pregnant speaks of her baby. The reason she refers to it as her baby is because she's choosing to keep the child and recognizes it for what it is. And the point he's making here is, though I am not yet born, yet I am alive, and, yet I have, and, and you have plans for me even before I have separated the womb. And that's the point that he's making here. And so it gives us insight into that. Verse 17, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. 
If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I'm, st I'm still with you. Uh, your plans, the word thoughts there, when he speaks how great are your thoughts, how precious are your thoughts, the word thoughts there, how precious are your, your plans. God, in other words, has plans for my life. Uh, the Bible makes it very clear, by the way, that he does. In Psalm 40, verse 5, uh, the psalmist said, Many, O Lord, my God, are your wonderful works which you've done. Your thoughts or plans toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they're more than can be numbered. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, the prophet said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So he says, how precious are your thoughts or your plans for me? What are your plans that I might have a future and a hope? In verse 19, oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. He's simply saying, uh, your enemies are my enemies. When he says, I hate them, I, he's saying, I, I utterly reject them. I refuse to have fellowship with those who blaspheme you. I refuse to have relationship with them. They're my enemies because they are, they are your enemies. Finally, search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Now, he had begun this psalm in 139 by saying, you have searched me. And he concludes this Psalm 139 with an invitation for this searching to continue. That word search there it means to ransack. You know, leave nothing unturned. Go through my life, and, and I'm asking you to do this, from A to Z, and tear it all apart. And if there's a wickedness in me, I want it removed. And that's an invitation to the Lord. Know my heart, try me, know my anxieties. See if there's any wicked way in me. If you do find that, then I want to I forsake that because I want to be led in the way everlasting. And I know that no wicked thing, I know that no sinful thing enters into the kingdom of God. Therefore, whatever it is that I may have in my life that keeps me from having fellowship with you is a thing that I don't want. So, Lord, I'm asking you to search me. You know, I'll close with this thought. There are some things that we, that we allow ourselves to do um, knowing uh, somewhere inside that it may not be the most proper thing to do, but we allow ourselves to do those things because we think that's just part of being who we are. And sometimes we, we, we have a, a temper, so we'll say, well, yeah, I have a temper. We might even get, you know, a little ethnic about it. We say, well, yeah, I've got a temper because I'm Italian. You know, Italians are just boisterous. Or, yeah, I got a little drinking problem, you know, and I know there's a stereotype, and forgive me for it, but, yeah, I got a little bit of a problem drinking, you know, but I'm Irish, you know, Irish like to drink, you know. You know, I know I like to spray paint, but I'm Mexican. What can I do, you know? <laughs> I mean, we... No, I'm playing, right. You know I'm playing with you. Somebody's going to get all mad and spray paint my, 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 my car. I'm just kidding. <laughs> the bottom line is we can excuse ourselves, and that's the point I'm making. We can excuse ourselves by simply saying, well, that's just our nature. But you know what? What God hates, we ought to hate too. Don't you think? What, what, what God hates, we ought not to make excuse for. If God hates it, then why would I like it? If God, if God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to save me from that, then why am I working so hard to keep it in my life? And you know what? It's, it's, it's a saying, it's like, kissing the tip of the spear that plunged into the side of Jesus when we keep sins in our life like they're okay. They're not okay. Jesus died on the cross to save me from it. So, Lord, search me. Know my heart. Know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting because I want to be on the same page as you. So keep me faithful to you, and I give you full permission to ransack me and reveal to me what you don't like so that I can release it. Now, I've told my wife, Marie, you need to tell me what you don't like about me, so I give you permission. 
If there's something about me you don't like, let me know. Because I don't want to be unpleasing to you. I want you to like me and love me. Therefore, let me know. And I've told her this, I'm not a mind reader. I can't figure out. And I don't take hints very well either. So you're just going to have to be direct. And if you don't like this about me, let me know. And if it's not pleasing to you, I'm going to change it. Now, if that's true with my wife, how much more so with my God?